Um, so fun story, uh, Ray. So so we're we're getting a little bit narrow when we when we're talking about female villains and Batman films because there's quite a few Batman films more than than we ever typically. Rick Hall, so we're going from the late 80s through to the early 90s, right? The big ones. Because, of course, there's another, there's like, what? what's there been, like, three, four? No, there's been lo loads of Catwoman's on film, right? Because if you go way back, was that Lee? Uh, it was, like, the other white one. The second white one was in the, it was in the Can't Get Rid of a Bomb movie, right? Um, and then you, you've got, um, of course, um lovely last won an oscar not for that movie Halle Berry right she did another Catwoman film we're not talking about that Catwoman film um and and you know Anne Hathaway she technically did not play Catwoman because they never said Catwoman in the film and you know Lego Batman happened and so on and so forth so talking about late 80s to early 90s so Gen X Millennials you know the vibes Zoomers, get on Netflix or you're fucked. <laughs> We're just going right in on, on the Zoomers today and we don't know why. Great climate change activists, great, you, you know, school shooting activists, love them. Um, and, and of course, the Gravel Institute and those little fucking trolls. But so the point is, we're talking about like what we like to refer to as the unholy trinity, right? So you've got Michelle Pfeiffer in Batman Returns. Um, as Selena Kyle, Catwoman, and she is actually Catwoman because they say the word Catwoman in the film. Novel concept. Paige and Christopher Nolan. Perhaps when you're playing around with time travel with Tenet, you can go back in time and call Catwoman, Catwoman in your bloody film with Catwoman in it. Anyway, second one that we're going to be going and, and talking about is um, Uma Thurman as Poison Ivy and Batman and Robin. Right? You know the one with the scary spice hair. And the green eyebrows, the leafy eyebrows, the whole thing. You know, she has, she has, we have not seen that film in quite some time. And she's got a lot of fucking looks. She's got the Jackie Onassis thing. We totally forgot about that one, right? With the, with the scarf that she had going on there. She had some fucking looks. There was a lot of old Hollywood glamour going on. And she had this look when she was walking over people. Um, and, and just, she had looks for days. Right, the they spent a lot of money on Arnold Schwarzenegger on that film. They spent even more on Uma Thurman's costumes, probably more than they paid that poor lass for that film because Hollywood is mad. Misogynistic, but you knew that. And the third one we'll be talking about is, of course, Miss Harley Quinn in the cult cinematic classic Suicide Squad because we know you fucking love that film. Um, and you're gonna hate that you love the narrative that we tease out of it because you yeah, fucking hate that film and that's probably quite fair but it's okay we're gonna have fun death of the author all that jazz whatever we're here to have some fun um so like, the point of this is, is not to vindicate large hollywood films that made millions and perhaps billions of the box office and sold lots of happy meals and lots of toys and did all of these sometimes great things and sometimes terrible things for people's careers, right? That's not the point of this, right? So we're not we're not out here to vindicate Joel Sch Joel Schumacher, right? Because that lad has apparently had sex with a thousand people in his lifetime or some ridiculous number like that. And you know he doesn't need any more validation. He's good, right? He's got what he fucking needs. <laughs> and Tim Burton, you know, lad came back to Disney Animation Studios, bleeding out his face and took pictures of it and, and now he makes naff films um, after 20 years of good films and, and that's him and he does not need our help. David Ayer, perhaps he does need our help, perhaps he doesn't, we just do not know but he's doing okay. Um, so the point is is to connect the ideas that we're discussing in the narrative frameworks to ways that we can talk about actual trans characters who are described as trans characters or just have some fun with it, right? So. We're latching on to the Batman films to talk about this because we love Batman films. You love Batman films, and it's an easy way to get some theory and some chatting in, right? And and a reason to get all gussied up as this cute, strange clown girl who floats in the sewer because she's got great big fuck off tits that costs her a lot of money to get. So that's fantastic, right? Um, and there will be no gangbangs in that sewer. No, 
No, no, this is not the Stephen King novel version of this story. Not at all. Great. So, interesting thing. Um, it, it just, just to kind of tease out what the similarities and what the differences between what we like to call the unholy trinity is. Right. So, all three of their origin stories do involve violent men. Right interesting right because the the fulcrum is not necessarily the cause of but let's say the incitement of the personal transformations that they enact in their films all have to do with violent men so interestingly enough for her for, mm, for miss selena kyle who becomes catwoman and dr pamela isley who becomes poison ivy this is both um workplace related incidents right and and per particularly men with power in the workplace that fuck them up right and and patience phillips who <laughs> is Halle berry's Catwoman, incidentally uh this pattern also applies to her right so it, it's probably quite um easy to explain why they did that because probably mr akiva goldsman who was actually quite a respected star trek creator now and uh, when he came on to do the script for Batman and Robin, it's like, well, last time we had a female villain, there was this great little story of like a corrupt boss uh, trying to kill his employee, and then she came back as the villain. And so she's a sympathetic villain. She's a bit of an anti hero. She's an interesting kind of a character. So why don't we do that again? Right? So in Batman Returns, right, with um with Catwoman, with, with Ms. Michelle Pfeiffer, the blonde bombshell Catwoman. With her, it's it's Max Shrek played by um, Christopher Walken, who, as far as we know, is is an original creation. Was not a character in the comics prior. Do not think he was one since anyway. But point being, she brings irregularities to her boss. He throws her out the window. She narrowly survives and is rescued by some cats. And then she goes home and whips up a fury and she creates her own Catwoman outfit. She changes her neon sign from hello there to hell and here. And now the, the dark, the sexy right? um, Catwoman emerges from the mousy um, Selena Kyle that, that we saw before that. right? And in that version of Selena Kyle has nothing to do with any Catwoman that we'd ever seen prior to that. Particularly not the bold, brash, buzz-cutted um sex worker uh selena kyle that frank miller and david mazzuccelli reintroduced in batman year one for all intents and purposes the or catwoman right um and then in in um, batman and robin right, with uh poison ivy it's we believe dr jason woodrow who is the floronic man and we personally have only read any comics with him in them uh when it was um Swamp Thing, right? He was a he was a Swamp Thing villain for five minutes in the first arc of Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. So good for him, a, a completely fucking obscure asshole, right? But the point is, is, is that these attempted murders by shitty bosses and these lasses transform themselves into something brand fucking new. So patriarchy, violent patriarchy. You know, these women are punished for standing up for themselves, but the universe, nature, Gotham City, whatever it is gives them a second lease on life as something much bigger, much grander, more sexual, more you know, less repressed. So it's fascinating, right, that that all three of them, right, and we'll get to Harley because she's a bit more complicated, but all three of them, especially these two, well sorry, all three of them go through some kind of trauma in Gotham City and emerge stronger, more powerful and less repressed, right? But it's such a fucking opposite thing that, that happens to Batman, right? Because you know, young Bruce Wayne, Martha's Pearls, blah, blah, blah. You know, the parents are dead, Mask of Zorro, or some fucking pretentious opera in Christopher Nolan's version because nobody can go see a Zorro film in Christopher Nolan's very serious Batman films, right? And he can't have any worthwhile female characters in them either. And Bane's got to be white for reasons we just do not understand. But not that Batman and Robin was better in that case, but... We just like to rag on Christopher Nolan sometimes, right? It's just a tenet of ours. Anyway, so so with Batman, right, it, it traumatizes him. His parents die. He becomes Batman. But, like, Batman is this, this quite severely repressed character. And you see that very, very clearly in Batman 
returns, right? Because, you know, Selena, she's got him, you know, she's pounced on him, she's looking at his face, and he's like, no, you cannot get on top of me, look at me. And it's just like, he's more repressed in these films particularly, but largely um, this is true to the comics as well. But Batman is typically, sorry, Bruce Wayne is more repressed, more stuck up, more stodgy when he's Batman than when he's Bruce Wayne. Like, you see this a lot in the in the Connor, Paul Neotti, Harley Quinn comics. Um, because, like, Bruce is, he's charismatic, he's caring, he's sympathetic to Harley, he wants to see her win and do well and succeed at life, right? But it's Batman who's like, no, I know what you are. I'm going to scare you into being better. Or, like, if you fuck up, what are on you, right? So... There's this hilarious thing where, you know, you think at first Harley's got some kind of weird double vision between the two, and then you realize that Bruce is just fucking gaslighting her. You know, ah, grand ironies, right? Um, but that's just it. You always get this picture of, like, his trauma repressed him more so, right? And this outlet for him to deal with his trauma makes him more repressed. It's just... It's a nightmare. It's a living nightmare that this man is in. But the lasses who undergo these similar types of trauma, more direct, more violent to them, right, than seeing their ma or pa get, you know, shot by Joe Chill while he's, you know, dancing in the moonlight with the devil or whatever it is that he happens to do at that precise moment. But, um, you know, for them, they get thrown out of windows, they get poisoned, they take a dive into chemicals. They always come out better feeling better about who they are, right? And they rebel against the society that, that put them into the positions that they were in, right? So it's so fascinating because, like, of course, Catwoman is usually quite sympathetic because she's quite attractive. She's quite charming. But also, she's got a few points, right? She's always got some points, that lass. She's, she's you know, you, you've got to pay attention to her. She always knows which, which side of the bread is buttered because, like a cat, she always lands on her feet. And if you strap a piece of toast to a cat, um, that's animal abuse and don't do that. Um, but that's just, it, it's so fascinating because they always reveal the female Batman villains in practically every single incarnation they've ever been in. Show the broken aspects of both Bruce Wayne himself and his and his morality in general, right? It's, it's fucking hilarious and we are here for it every single fucking time, right? Um... So these transformations on their own, they don't necessarily point to transness in specific. With Miss Selina Kyle, right, you, you could kind of say, sure, this is there, there's so many other things that this could point to. And, you know, fair dues, but we'd like to claim her for her own, so we will, right? No. Um, but the point is that, yeah, she can accommodate far more readings. But one thing you'll notice... Um, is that right and, and perhaps lots of girls lots of lasses of you know cis trans intersex all of all of those manifestations of of sex as we call it any way that you could be assigned at birth um lots of them in that cohort you know love catwoman and poison ivy and uh harley quinn but you'll find that the dolls that trans lasses quite love these particular lasses in particular right we don't think it's it but this is just it because it, it's not like we see them we know right away it's it, there's just something about them about their transformations about the ways that they embrace these new cells that can speak to us in strange ways before we even know who we are particularly if you look at say us right exactly we've got our harley quinn tattoo you look at um Look at Sonic, uh, the Rue girl, right? She's got that um, Catwoman licking the um, Bat Batman popsicle on her um, on her arm. She's got a tattoo. She's got a, just a gigantic strain of, of toys of all three of the lasses and all this. And, you know, who knows? You're, you're Gen X, you're Millennial. You love those lasses, maybe. But we think there's a little bit more. To, that there's, there's a bit of a subtext that speaks to you before it is that you know who you are, right? And, and these kinds of things can manifest in, in different ways, right? They have nothing to do with trans at all. You just kind of recognize something in a character that you didn't know about yourself. Until you know that about yourself later and you kind of go, right, and, and you got that big moment. Um, 
but there there is something about the, that transformation and why we love these characters. But with Poison Ivy, um, we like to think it is a lot more direct and, and a lot more intentional. Um, and one of the things that separates it out from the other two, um, from, from, from Catwoman and Harley Quinn, is that Jules Schumacher is a gay man, as we previously established. Um, and, and quite good at being gay, if, you know, promiscuity is a measure of being good at being gay, right? Um, but this is just it, because, of course, everybody likes to say, oh, those films are so gay, whether they knew that Joel Schumacher was or not. Because the whole, the, the rubber, you know, the rubber nipples, mostly, right? And the crotch bulges and the shots of the butt straight up, right? Um, but, of course, it has to be gay. There's There's never, ever been an instance where heterosexual men would, would you know, put front and center their um you know their hard bodies and and their and their you know bulges and their rears to show off how you know virile and powerful they are and these kinds of things right there's there's definitely not a documentary called pumping iron starring arnold schwarzenegger who just so happened to play mr freeze and batman and robin that didn't happen right heterosexual men never make flagrant displays of their own virility in, in any kind of artistic pursuit. That just doesn't happen. It's purely a manifestation of the homosexual, right? Um, obviously, we're being quite sarcastic here, but they were so laser focused on this one particular thing, and this is just where the culture was as well at the point, is that they're missing the really, really fucking gay parts of the film, right? And this is something that, to a certain degree, has puzzled us since we were children, and that kind of tells you just how fucking pedantic we've always been about comic books and these kinds of things. But we started reading Batman comics seriously long after the two films and we got our big glass mugs from McDonald's and all that shite. Right. Um, they're like, Poison, and Ivy and Bane have not got a single fucking thing to do with each other. They never have. They probably never will. And it's sort of like, why did those two get paired together? Like, the Riddler and <laughs> and Two-Face were quite the odd fucking couple. And, you know, there's there's quite a Will and Grace, like, Jack and Will thing going on with those two, right? There's also an interesting gay dynamic between those two. And, of course, between Jim Carrey and Tommy Lee Jones in real life. <laughs> but that's another video for someone else to do because it's just not our jam. But point is that yes Joel Schumacher likes his queer coded um, odd couples but there's something very very specific going on with Bane who looks almost nothing like he does in the comics right? that's not a luchador mask at all right it's 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 a big BDSM thing it has nothing to do with lucha libre or Mexican pro wrestling or any of that kind of shit which is what he's supposed to look like in the original comics right and all of that is gone He's just a big, bad leather daddy, right? Just huge fucking muscles, BDM, BDSM mask, the whole deal, right? It's it's so it's so funny that, that the 90s had two Uma Thurman movies that, that also involved um, BDSM leather masks in two very, very different ways. Um, but so, so you had him, right? And then you had Poison Ivy, the extremely campy, very clearly, like, drag influence to say the very least character this extremely flamboyant sexual seductive female character right who's paired with this hyper masculine manly man whatever right and you can see how they pose together in in the photos and all of these things right and so they clearly want us to look at the contrast that these are two ends of a spectrum of gender performance right and so, of course, to your average straight person in the 1990s, they're just like, yeah, you know, that's that that's man and that's woman, right? And it and it's just, that's as far as it goes, right? That, that it just kind of reinforces their views of gender, right? And and that's what's so funny, because when you've got these gay, when you've got these gay and queer restagings of, of what look like the extremes of gender, right? It's camp, it's Susan Sontag, right? And they're, they're exploding it into... Um, into the, these novel uh, interpretations that take the piss out of it while also expressing something quite profound about themselves, right? The kinds of genealogies of gender that Judas Butler likes to talk about, yeah. Um, and, you know, there's like the Tom of Finland of it all with Bane, right? 
the Tom of Finland of it all. And you can talk about hypermasculinity in superhero comics all you want, right? That 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 um, that applies to that. But that one in particular, you get that, and then you've got Ivy. Um, and, and this is the thing, yes, it's a cisgender woman playing this character, but can you imagine what would have happened if they had tried, if Schumacher had said, I'd like you to cast this young twink in this role, <laughs> or try to find, you know, a, a drag queen at, at, at that time, of which there were many, right? But this is the time, of course, you've got to remember in Hollywood that they love sticking drag queens in this kind of queer-coded stuff into their films. Because as we should all fucking know by now, right, that Ursula in The Little Mermaid is quite extremely obviously divine. There's no two ways about that, right? And so it's fascinating because if, if we look at like what is the equivalent to Poison Ivy um, in the gay community, particularly at that time, um, that they would want to maybe riff on if this is supposed to be an, an image of a queer spectrum, is, you know, drag queens and trans women, the dolls, right? Um, and it's important to point out that in 1997, when this film came out, this hard line, this stupid partition that we have now between trans and drag did not exist the way it had to, um, did not exist the way that it does now, right? Because that was kind of a wall and Harry Neff recently got into this on our IG Live. Um, that's a kind of Berlin Iron Curtain wall or the fuck you want to call it that went up um, after the first couple seasons of Drag Race, and they would edit it, you know, trying to show um, these queens being like, hey, okay, I'm a woman on camera, you know, but then like I'm a man out of it, right? Like these these distinctions start to get really hard coded into the narrative, um, and you can see right, the the trans exclusionary aspect of Drag Race become far more pronounced as the seasons went on, right? Um, and, and it's like Sonic says, right, about Drag Race Queens, is that you, you look at some of them and they're they're just two pills a day away from being trans, like, because they've done their face, they've done this, they've done that, right? Because if you, you go back and, and you watch, um, and, and we'll come back to Dorian Corey again when we talk about Harley Quinn, uh, but if you go to Dorian Corey and, and that... And that was just the 80s, right? Um, and that generation of drag queens, and, and it's like they weren't necessarily calling themselves trans, or weren't necessarily calling themselves women, but they might get breast implants, might do these things, um, and, and might appear very much what we will call trans now, but it was so much more of an open space for those things to, um, to interact in, in, and in the 1990s. Um, you know, RuPaul was and probably still is quite comfortable in using the T-slur to, to refer to himself and drag queens in general um, and not just trans women, right? And we've kind of mentioned this before. There's that song, the T-chaser song that RuPaul did. And it certainly wasn't just about other girls who were trans that, that you know, these guys were after. It was any of the girls who were all dolled up and would, you know, take trade. So that's the important thing about Poison Ivy, right, is, is that, you know, you could say, yeah, she could be a drag queen, she could be trans, she could be both, but there was no a hard line between them. So it's not helpful to try and make a hard distinction and say she was either one or the other intended to be in that film, right? It's because it was a very fluid category then, and we would prefer if it would return to that fluidity because it's nice and it encourages community, and we're both and we love that about ourselves, right? Um, and so that's kind of what you see with Poison Ivy um, and, and why she comes off as being so exceptionally trans um, just because of the context and, and just how much of like gay culture, so much of gay culture and just aesthetics is just permeating that fucking film because of course Joel Schumacher is a very campy, you know, Broadway influenced gay man himself. So of course he's going to put all that stuff into it, right? just the, the Susan Sontag of it, right? The Judith Butler of it, right? And it's like, people must have known, there must have been analyses talking about this kind of stuff at the time, right? Because Gender Trouble came out in 1990. So these things like genealogies of gender and all that kind of stuff that she loves to ramble on about, it was out there, right? Um, Paris is Burning was out there, right? It was in the culture. The culture like was so much worse at talking about anything gay or queer back then in 1997 than it is now but it doesn't fucking matter right it, it was there people knew and you know someday we'd love to try to track down some of the more scholarly analyses and see if somebody did clock 
um, Ivy as, as, as representing a trans or, or drag um, manifestation of femininity despite the casting of that role. So that's fun and we love that. Um, and, and the third one, our last Harley Quinn. Th this is where things get interesting and a bit contentious, right? Because if we accept, right, if we accept that the Harley that we know and love with the breakfast sandwiches and the daddy's little monster and that entire thing across those both films, if we say that Harley is trans, right, well, then they're saying, well, does that make the Joker? Uh, yes. Yes, it absolutely fucking does make him one of those. And this particular Joker in particular. And that's where there's this kind of, like, gruesome, terrible, poetic justice to Jared Leto playing this version of the fucking Joker. Because the man is a fucking... Just, you know, we don't want to get shut down, so just Google the allegations that have been made against that man. They're not particular to the dolls, right, that we know of, but the man has proclivities that are not good. Um, and, or so we hear, allegedly, as the Bodega Boys love to say. Um, but he's just particularly suited to this particular kind of a controlling male figure who has a very keen interest in the way that the woman in his life presents herself in real life, right? So, here's the thing, right? Because so far as we know, Harley's origin in, um, in that film, in Suicide Squad, mirrors what her origin was in um, the Suicide Squad comic from Rebirth, which we've not read, because why would we do that to ourselves? No, Rebirth, sorry. Uh, Flashpoint, post-Flashpoint, New 52, 2011. Yeah, right. The one thing you think we get right in all of this and we fucking flub it. But yeah, the New 52 Suicide Squad. We think that's precisely how it was. Right? And we don't even entirely 100% remember what Harley's origin was in the cartoon, but it had something to do with taking a dive in the Ace Chemicals, whether she did it herself or the Joker put her up to it. We think the Joker put her up to it, right? So there's this big open question of agency, right, with Harley Quinn. And it's like, well, if you want to say Harley Quinn is trans, how much agency did she have in becoming Harley Quinn relative to the other two lasses who, you know, push out a window, poisoned to death, right? But quite clearly... Right, right. Christy is saying that we believe Joker pushed Harley and the B-Taz in the 1992, we believe the year was, um, version. Um, so there, there's this open question of what Harley's agency in the Suicide Squad film is over all of that. So, right, right, did she become Harley Quinn to please this man and, and all these kinds of things? And what does that say about the validity of her, trans of her transformation or her transness and, and all these types of questions? Um, and you know, that is fair to fucking interrogate Ma, right? So, you know, you're going to have to come up with the reading of, of the character in the situation that you're comfortable with, particularly if you are trans, right? But here's the way we see it, right? Because the edit, the theatrical edit of the film is a fucking mess. And there have been dreams of things written about it, right? So you do not need us to tell you all that shit again. You know, you know what the score is, you know the vibes. Um... But if you look at the extended cut, it's not a director's cut, interestingly enough, it's it's an extended cut, right? Then you, you'll kind of see that there's a whole scene before they even get up to the Ace Chemicals bit. And it was in the trailers, never made it to the film. Um, but the ba the Joker, right, was kind of going to kind of back out of the whole thing. He wasn't sure whether he wanted to, uh, to get her to do it or not. And she pulls a fucking gun on him. And she's like, we are fucking doing this, right? And she really pushes him into this whole thing right and and so when you see him up there and then he dives back down and all of that it's a bit more of a put on than the theatrical um version gives you right that he's like okay fine 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 i'll do this so now i've got to get back into character what's my motivation and action right so the joker is so much more of an idiot and a coward in in in, in that version than, than what we saw in the theatrical one so it sits a bit nicer right that you, you start to get the idea 
that Harley in certain ways manipulated the Joker to enact the transformation that she wanted, that she could not enact on her own. She found him as an opportunity to follow through on becoming what she wanted to be, right? And because they spend so little time on the Joker himself and you don't actually see him in Birds of Prey, that gets a little bit lost in the shuffle, right? That, that the state that she reaches in the Birds of Prey film is the end state that she was always reaching towards because the Joker was, to a certain extent, a means to an end for him. Um, for her who she got more entangled with than than she intended to right because feelings are feelings and shit happens right well this is what becomes so fascinating about all of this because who knows what david Ayer intended and so this is not like joel schumacher right where you can reasonably assume that he was like this is what poison ivy is reflecting she's reflecting drag she's reflecting trance she's reflecting this performance of femininity we see in the gay community and we do mean gay community because that's what he was reflecting right david Ayer, who knows uh, we don't know that we've ever heard him talk a single thing about china's issues or representation or any of that so who knows what he thinks but if you go and look up the story about dorian corey and the dead body that was in her apartment for years and years and years um, there was a, a particular piece of trade or long-term boyfriend or whatever it was that was in her life. And we believe that's who the body turned out to be. We cannot remember for sure. But anyway, we do know is that there was a man in her life that, um, that, that was quite intent on getting her to transition like completely, fully top, bottom, the whole fucking deal. She was not... It, interested in and and one theory of, of that whole thing is is that that's why the body ended up in the closet but the point is whatever the facts of that case are it, it, it was a point that there is a subterranean world of kind of sugar daddies chasers whatever it is that you want to call them men who have this like pygmalion right so let's not even call them chasers let's be more specific because Probably lots of you know that we don't love using that word and that term for very many for very very for many reasons. So it, we think it should be used very specifically in inter community. Anyway, point is, so let's say there's men with a certain Pygmalion complex towards women, and and there are straight men who are not interested in trans women who do this kind of thing as well if you've ever heard ice tea talk about coco's cosmetic surgery then you know precisely what it is that we're talking about here but there is a very particular world and a very particular practice of, of these pygmalion-esque men who are interested in funding or subsidizing um, the translated healthcare and surgeries of trans women that gives them a great deal of control over these women's lives, right? Um, and you kind of wonder a bit about that, about more than one person in um, Paris is burning, right? There it's like, I bought her tats, I bought her tits, right? You know the scene we're talking about, the guy with the mustache and the, the mullet and, and the hairy chest, we think, uh, if we recall correctly. But so you, you see that there, right? And and shades of it appear in the stories that have been told um, about Dorian Corey and then and the body in her closet. Um, but also like Chuck Palahniuk, and it's so funny that we're referencing Chuck Palahniuk on trans issues like twice in a row here. After the rattling sessions and, and that whole bonker story in Haunted. But um the whole thing in Invisible Monsters is that Brandy, if we recall her name, is like the trans woman who is a drag queen who is going on the road trip to kind of just clear her head before um, getting gender confirmation surgery. Um, she And on the road, she comes to the conclusion that she just kind of understands that she's been a little bit kind of emotionally manipulated by her drag family who have wanted her to undergo her transition in a very specific way and do specific things and come out looking a specific way and she needs to get some freedom and some air away from that and be like what is the woman that i want to be right you know is, is this what i want is that what i want right and and just kind of re-evaluating her own agency in this thing right and that's one of the reasons why, strangely, Chuck Palahniuk is, is so fascinating, so brilliant, um, and, and so worth reading whenever he does get into trans issues, because he's clearly not just done the clinical research to give you some real fucking spooky body horror and some of the descriptions of, of surgery pamphlets and stuff in the book, but 
that that you know he captures those narratives that we do not see elsewhere right like you don't kind of see those negotiations around like the social pressures of the people that might be around you and what it is that they think you want or what they think they want for you right and there's also um what's his name the the cop daddy from fucking svu who was like the who's got the wee unicorn in, in happy that follows around him around uh, you know the lad we're talking about. Um, he plays a cop on TV a lot. Um, he's quite handsome. Christopher Maloney, that's the man. You know, the... Um, so he's got a character in Pose, right? Who is this this same kind of a sugar daddy for Dominique Jackson's character. Um, and he's quite insistent that, you know, he wants to pay for her, her transition, her everything, whatever as long as she does not get bottom surgery, right? Like, this is his whole thing, because that's what he's, like, that's what he's into. That's what his attraction to trans women is. And so she has to give up this entire life that she's got. She's got this apartment, these furs, everything. She is kicked out, right? Because she goes ahead and she gets the surgery because that's what she wants for her own fucking body, right? And she pays the um, the price for that, right? Um. And that's kind of so so if if you look back at, at Harley Quinn in Suicide Squad and you look back at the Joker and you look back at the Ace Chemicals thing and and you you can understand thank you we quite love this cosplay as well. Um and you can see those dynamics in play again, right? Um where he's got this very possessive relationship towards her and he thinks that he's responsible for a transformation for becoming Harley Quinn and taking the leap. But when we see it in the flashback it was her that pushed him into it, and he was the one, like, let's just say, like, for argument's sake, instead of what the actual thing of it was, that he paid for it, right? And that was it, that he bought it, he spent the money, right? Because he had the access to it, right? So she got what she needed, right? Um, because the only way that she could find to get it was from him. And then when she breaks away from him, she is still that thing of what she is, right? And so if you want to take a look at Harley Quinn, and, and in particular, in very specific, um, the film, The Suicide Squad, and, and, and um, Birds of Prey version of, of her um, as trans, um, but uh, then, then there's a powerful thing about, like, it doesn't matter how it is that you start out on this journey, right? How it is that you got access to hormones, to surgery, to whatever is that at the end of the day, as long as you can claim agency over who you are, who you want to be, you know, it's, uh, it is what it is, right? Um, and, and there's, oh, of course, another situation, this one actually real life one was um, with Peppermint on Drag Race, right? And, and, it, and it's so funny because, well, it's not quite funny, it's a bit tragic, right? Because RuPaul has still not come around on this. Um, and has kind of put other girls in the same position that, that, that Peppermint described, but she was talking about how there was someone in the drag scene or, around where she was. Um, and, and she said um, that this individual approached her and, and, and said, you know, we'll give you the trans version of a fucking scholarship, you know, pay for, you know, your pills or shots, whichever you choose, your surgeries, all of this, right? free ride off you go you you can be the woman that you want to be the way you want to be right but there's a fucking catch you've got to give up drag to do it right and what a fucking awful faustian bargain that is like it's it's completely fucking out of pocket right no one should be put in that position it's disgusting right and it emphasizes that kind of iron curtain that berlin wall that went up um, between trans and drag, you know, after the 1990s, as drag race caught on, and you start to see that kind of editorializing in, in the edits and such. Um, and that's kind of, and, and again, that's a narrative that's quite similar to Harley Quinn's, because even if she was more lucid than we typically give her credit for in that situation, she said, okay, I can become what it is that I want to be if I accept this man's intervention knowing that it could be quite dangerous right it was still that same kind of difficult bargain um that that, that she had to make right uh 
that say peppermint was faced with and of course she said no she got on diagrams she got the cash she got her tits herself and etc right and of course the irony is, is that rupaul wants to be oprah wants to have that great chat and get to bring this beautiful story out right but then what happens to Gia Gunn when she shows up on All Stars, right? It, it, it's that she put aside a certain, she, she paused a certain procedure so that she was, she could still qualify to go on All Stars. Okay? And um, if you believe in that kind of thing, she got the villain edit, but she was also apparently told uh, backstage that she was just there to clean up somebody else's mess, presumably Peppermint, because Peppermint had reopened all the old questions about the... Um, hypocrisies behind uh, trans participation in Drag Race and they needed to close the book by showing oh look we brought Gia on so it's not so bad but in fact it just re you know it, it just re-inscribed the hard line that was there and you know Sonique will still tell you the same fucking thing on her IG live when she's laying up a fucking bull right so so if, if you look at that network of experiences and particularly where we where the community is now right um harley quinn as as a trans metaphor right in suicide squad it's quite powerful and speaks to many experiences because of course post took place in the 1980s right um the situation described with dorian corey happened in the 1980s or the 70s through the 80s we're not sure entirely but it was it's quite a span of time there and perhaps even into the 90s and, and of course the peppermint situation is quite recent uh, through the 2000s we would believe right so it, it captures this this experience that it's it's not a kind happy easy bounce back from trauma the way that you could see well not necessarily easy but this this really legibly simply empowering um bounce back from trauma that you see that catwoman and poison ivy have hardly you know her agency her actions all of that it's much muddier right and and to some of us that's going to be much more attractive because it might align more with our lived experiences um and with our, our self-conceptions or the things that we see around in our own community right and so to wrap up and and, and to put put a fine point on all of it again we're not here to vindicate the films that these portrayals came from they vindicate themselves and made millions of dollars they sold lots of happy meals well suicide squad did not sell any happy meals but the other two films did your poor parents probably have loads of those giant glass frosted fucking mugs from batman forever and batman returns um and batman and robin in their attics or their basements or a storage facility in Camden, New Jersey, who knows, but they're all taking up space somewhere out there, right? So they made their money, they got their cultural claim. But more to the point, um, <laughs> there, yes, yes, the cat does want to get in on the discussion. She keeps hearing Catwoman, she's like, bitch, you are no own voices for Catwoman, you do not have the fucking range. Who are you to be talking about cats and Catwoman? You know, she she feels like she's got more expertise than us. Um, but she is a cisgender female Tory, so she can fuck off. <laughs> um, right, but, but this is just it. We, we don't particularly um, need to vindicate these films, but instead we can use them as opportunities as to, to bridge the gaps in the culture, to bridge the gaps in the conversations. Because if we want to talk to you about something like gender euphoria um you know you can go through and say oh the first time i did drag this light came on and y you know the god came down from heaven and, and all that kind of thing you can go on on that and and that might work for you right and, and and it's a cute story and it's true right um and as we said just the other day that like allison bechtel did this in fun home right in in, in the bit when she's with her dad in the in in, in the uh the diner right and she sees this butch woman come in. She doesn't realize that being a butch woman is a thing that you can be until then. She's like, oh my goodness, I can be this, right? And so she has this big fart moment. And of course, later on in her life, she gets to do it, you know, because her parents don't like it anytime she tries to put on like a bow tie and a button-up shirt. She's got to wear the frilly dresses and all this, right? So these kinds of experiences are not exclusive to the trans community, right? And that's one of the big reasons why we wanted to say that Catwoman and Batman Returns is is the loosest, right? There's there's the um, the loosest rationale um, for um, 
trying to interpret her as as transgender, right? And, and all these characters, women who experience trauma and and use it to rebuild themselves. There's so many different contexts that anybody can reclaim that from, right? Or appropriate it from. So we're taking one lens at it because we want to open up the rhetorical framework to create more empathy, more understanding, and more appreciation of theory and and what trans aesthetics and culture could look like, right? If they weren't all fucking driven and run by um, the dysphoria frame, right? And, and we think that's kind of all there is that we need to say on the topic. We